Welcome to lecture number 12, the New Deal and the Farm Securities Administration. So I want to talk a little bit about documentary work, documentary photography. And one really can't do that without mentioning Eugene Atche. So early documentary work was meant to show people the facts of the world. Events were suspect unless there was a photograph of it. And the intent was to describe the world around you. So at J makes a series of images of Paris, a Paris that he loved. He undertook a massive documentation of what he referred to as the glories of old Paris, creating over 10,000 images over the course of 30 years. So the photographer is attempting to show us the truth. So though early documentary work appears to be objective, it can't be completely objective as the images are indeed shown through the filter of the photographer's eye. So we've already talked about how uh, Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine chose to use photography to highlight and potentially reform social injustices, but let's jump ahead to the 1920s in America. So here we see a couple of images of crowds flowing into Wall Street after the stock market crash of October of 1929. So the wealth and prosperity of the Roaring Twenties came to a sudden halt that day with the crash of the stock market and the subsequent Great Depression in America, a decade-long period of poverty and homelessness for much of the country. Unemployment reached nearly 25%. Crop prices fell by 60%. Trade fell by half. It was a time in which millions of Americans would lose their homes, their jobs, and their livelihoods. And this time gave rise to a new generation of documentary work. The darkness of the Depression affected artists strongly. In painting, there was a return to realism, um, and in the documentary genre of photography, the 1930s term documentary began to be used to talk about the non-fictional representation of the world. The documentary photographers of the 30s strove to present their human subjects as ordinary people who were temporarily down on their luck, hoping of course that the viewer would put themselves in their shoes. Um, so their work was often less patronizing than early social documentary work, such as Heinz and Reese's, um, and it was not initially intended to spur any kind of reform. So here we see an image by Walker Evans. So Walker Evans was a young, well-educated man who took up photography after failing to find a career path that really suited him. And in 1929, he visited Alfred Stieglitz in hopes of gaining insight into his work. Apparently, it was a fairly uneventful meeting. And in fact, he said that he thought Steichen was too commercial and Stieglitz was too artsy in their approaches to the medium and that he would somehow fall somewhere between the two. Evans was equally scornful of overly artistic photography, like the um, pictorialism, for instance, of the camera work crowd and of advertising photography. But after perusing multiple issues of camera work, only one image stood out to him, that of artist Paul Strand. He admired Strand's uncompromising realism and lack of emotionality and the directness of the image, as we see here in this young boy by Paul Strand. In 1935, the Resettlement Administration in America was an agency whose purpose was to aid the poor rural Americans who had been uprooted from their tenant farms during the Depression and often forced to move to urban areas to find jobs. It later became known as the FSA, or Farm Securities Administration, and the agency became interested in documenting the changes taking place in rural and urban America. Roy Stryker was hired as the head of the historical section, and he focused on showcasing the agency's work through the medium of photography. In 
Walker Evans was one of the first photographers hired by Roy Stryker. Evans had been working for a number of years photographing the world as it interested him and was well connected in New York artistic circles. And here we see an image by Walker Evans that was included in a book by the poet Archibald McLeish in 1937. Evans' work is starkly descriptive, connoting honesty and objectivity. He wrote extensively on the subject of photography. The serious photographer knows that his work must contain four basic qualities, according to Evans. These are basic to the special medium of the camera, lens, chemical, and paper. And these are the four basic qualities as described by Evans. One, absolute fidelity to the medium itself, being faithful to the idea that the camera describes in a neutral manner. Two, complete realization of natural uncontrived lighting. Three, rightness of in-camera viewfinding and framing. And four, general but unobtrusive technical mastery. Don't let the technique get in the way of the idea. And another thing that Evans said in relation to these four basic qualities is that, quote, photography is the most literary of the graphic arts. It will have, on occasion and in effect, qualities of eloquence, of wit, grace, economy, style, of course, paradox and play, and oxymoron, end quote. So these are images that Walker Evans undertook in Alabama, photographing families, people down on their luck, sharecroppers, in a very stark, very straightforward, clean, descriptive manner. In 1936, Evans joined the writer James A.G. in an effort to document the tenant farms of Alabama for an article in Fortune magazine. The magazine ended up rejecting the article, but the work the two completed eventually became a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, with photos by both Evans and text by A.G. And these are some of the images from Let Us Now, Praise Famous Men, Allie Mae Burroughs, Floyd Burroughs Work Shoes. The photographs in the book were not intended as illustrations, rather they stood alone as images. They were printed in a group at the beginning of the book with no caption or explanation. As A.G. wrote, they were not illustrative. They and the text are co-equal, mutually independent, and fully collaborative. The next photographer I'm going to talk about is Dorothea Lange. Dorothea Lange was exposed to photography by Arnold Genthy in New York City. Uh, impressed by Genthy's photographs of Isadora Duncan, um, she applied for a job at his Fifth Avenue studio. She was the youngest of three women on the staff and worked as a receptionist. She eventually started making proofs, spotting, retouching, and mounting prints. Ganthi gave her her first camera and offered critical evaluation of her work for the next year or so. Lang, who had been in teacher's, teacher training college, quit school and took up photography full-time, studying with Clarence White at Columbia University. By 1933, Lang quit commercial photography entirely and took up photographing the, quote, forgotten man in labor strikes and demonstrations. She moves out to California, and here's one of her early photographs in San Francisco. And begins photographing 
the social conditions of the city. Uh, people, for instance, standing in a bread line. Lang's images of homeless and unemployed were exhibited with the group called F64 in Willard Van Dyke's Oakland Gallery. And I'll be talking about F64 in the next lecture. Roy Stryker of the Farm Securities Administration had seen some of Lang's work in an illustrated survey of agricultural problems in California, in which she had collaborated with her then husband, Paul Taylor. In 35, Lang was hired by the FSA to document labor camps in California that were populated by Dust Bowl refugees. And this arose, of course, as a result of the great drought in the lower Midwest and South. But unlike Evans, Lang came to the FSA with a sure sense of social justice and how photography could reveal inequality. With sociologist and writer Paul Taylor, Lang traveled the West extensively, stopping, talking to people, getting to know their stories, and of course, photographing. This is perhaps one of the most famous images of American photography in the 20th century. This is indeed by Dorothea Lang. So this image was made at a pea pickers camp in Napomo, California. This is north of San Luis Obispo in the Central Valley. So she says when speaking of this photograph, I was following instinct, not reason. I saw and approached the hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I do remember she asked me no questions. I made five exposures, working closer and closer from the same direction. I did not ask her name or her history. She told me her age and that she was 32. She said that they had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that the children would kill with rocks. She had just sold tires from her car to buy food, and there she sat in that lean-to tent with her children huddled around her and seemed to know that my pictures might help her, and so she helped me. There was a sort of a quality about it. So notice how the cropping of this particular image accentuates the hard life of this farm worker. So sometimes her images were without people and just purely focusing on a landscape composition. Lang's photographs often helped the situations of these people. Um, they were published by United Press and working with government authorities, she would sometimes call for aid that would be sent, for instance, to the pea pickers camp that she had just seen. She says, quote, my own approach is based on three considerations. First, hands off. Whatever I photograph, I do not molest or tamper with or arrange. Second, a sense of place. Whatever I photograph, I try to picture as part of its surroundings, as having roots. And third, a sense of time. Whatever I photograph, I try to show as having its position in the past or in the present. End quote. The collaboration between Lang and Taylor culminated in a book titled An American Exodus in 1939. And unlike Let Us Now Praise Famous Men by Evans and Agee, there's a close relationship between the text and image as the text is often excerpts from a conversation that had, were being had at the time of the photographing. So it was a wholly documentary approach. After leaving the FSA, Lang went on to photograph other desperate social conditions, such as the Japanese internment camps of the California at Manzanar, and also for Life magazine. To carry out the mission of the FSA, 
Roy Stryker held briefings. He gave reading assignments, conducted critiques, and he developed shooting scripts for the field assignments, formulating an official FSA documentary style. The photographs taken for the FSA were edited, were narrated, and distributed to media outlets around the country. We introduced Americans to Americans, said Stryker. So this image by Arthur Rothstein becomes an iconic view of the Dust Bowl, showing the loss of topsoil due to wind and improper farming practices. So though sometimes stylized, the FSA photographs were taken by the middle-class audience as objective truth. Rothstein said, because powerful images are fixed in the mind more readily than words, the photographer needs no interpreter. A photograph means the same thing all over the world and no translator is required. Photography is truly a universal language, transcending all boundaries of race, politics, and nationality. Defining the difference between the news media and the FSA photographs. Stryker said, news pictures are the noun and the verb. Our kind of photography is the adjective and the adverb. The news picture is a single frame, ours a subject viewed in series. The news picture is dramatic, all subject and action. Ours shows what's back of the action. And here we see the eroded landscape of Alabama. And this image sparked a bit of a controversy at the time. Arthur Rothstein had photographed several frames of a steer's skull in the Badlands of South Dakota. And a comparison of the images showed that he picked up the skull and moved it to a patch of cracked earth, probably about 10 feet away, in order, uh, in all likelihood, to make it more symbolic of the drought. Um, so opponents in the press and Congress seed, seized on this to attack the agency's credibility, the agency being the FSA. They called the picture a fake. Um, so the incident caused minor embarrassment to, uh, embarrassment to President Roosevelt when the Fargo Forum broke the story as he was campaigning in the Dakotas. Ben Sean, another photographer that worked for the FSA, made pictures of middle America during this time. And many of his images take the cities and small towns as subject matter. So here we see itinerant photographer in Columbus, Ohio. Itinerant, of course, meaning, meaning traveling. Sean's images focus on individual character and personality in many cases. He utilized unusual angles and cropping and was sometimes known to use a right angled lens camera for unobtrusive views. Carl Maidens was a photojournalist for Life magazine. He was one of the very earliest. And he also worked for Stryker and later photographed during World War II. So here we see a mother and baby, a family of nine living in the field on US Route 70 near the Tennessee River. Another photographer hired by Stryker for the FSA was Marion Post Wolcott, who had been a teacher in a small Massachusetts town during this time. She took up photography while visiting her sister in Europe and was encouraged by Viennese photographer Trudy Fleischmann. She later joined the New York Photo League and Wolcott was recommended to Roy Stryker by Paul Strand. Another example, of course, of the tight knit photographic world during that time period. Marion Post Wolcott's work was often focused on the, count, the country's sense of physical and spiritual plenty. Um, this is a time in which you see 
people being tired of seeing images of out of work and down and out people. So this becomes a new strategy of the FSA during the 1940s, focusing on more positive elements. Gordon Parks was an African-American photographer from Minnesota, and he came to the FSA on a fellowship and began to work and train with Roy Stryker. Having grown up in the North, Parks was unprepared for the Southern culture of Washington, D.C. So a story about the meeting between Stryker and Gordon Parks goes this way. After asking Parks to leave his camera in the office, Stryker sent the newly arrived photographer around Washington, instructing him to visit stores, restaurants, and theaters. When Parks refused service, he became furious and returned to the office, ready to show the rest of the world what your great city of Washington, D.C. is really like. And he proposed to photograph scenes of injustice and portraits of bigots. So this is one of the first images he made after this experience. Parks followed and photographed Ella Watson, the woman in the previous photograph, in various aspects of her life creating a photo essay, a medium that he employed many times during his career. After the dissolution of the FSA in 1943 due to political reasons, Parks and many other FSA photographers went on to non-government projects under Stryker, including a documentary project for Standard Oil in an aim to improve the company's public image. This, of course, is in stark contrast to the previous work as an apostle of the downtrodden, um, working for the big oil companies. Other Parks accomplishments include Life Magazine photographer, Vogue fashion photographer, novelist of a book called The Learning Tree, and a filmmaker, a poet, essayist, etc. And there's a wonderful documentary about him called Half Past Autumn, The Life and Work of Gordon Parks. And another photographer during this time who did not work for the FSA, but also worked in the documentary genre was actually author Eudora Welty. She took up the camera in the 1930s and photographed in and around Mississippi as she traveled the state writing articles for the WPA, or Works Progress Administration, and local newspapers. Here, Carl Maiden's photographs are featured in this famous book by Richard Wright, which is 12 Million Black Voices, A Folk History of the Negro in the United States, published in 1941. And lastly, Esther Bubbly worked briefly for Stryker and the FSA um, and ended up photographing for the Standard Oil Project and Life Magazine, Ladies Home Journal, etc. She built a portfolio early on by photographing life in the boarding house where her sister Enid lived, which catered to young women who'd flocked to Washington, D.C. to fill wartime jobs. And that's the end of my lecture today. Thanks for listening.